Chapter 74 Blue I wake up with a start, my arm aching from shoulder to wrist like it's taken the brunt of a nasty fall. My sleep-addled mind takes a minute to process the world around me. I blink, trying to clear the odd spots that dance in front of my eyes. I'm still in Kara's bed. Though the sheets beside me are wrinkled, they are noticeably bereft of my master. I try not to feel bitter about that, and go back to trying to figure out what exactly just happened. I've been dreaming about... something. I'm used to nightmares. I'm familiar with the broken versions of memories that my mind clips together just to see how quick it can pull me out of what little restful sleep I'd been able to manage before coming here. But I am quite unfamiliar with... whatever this was. I can barely remember what happened, and while that's usually a sign of some of my best dreams, I can't help but feel that I'm missing something notable. I remember a white mist, and a sky, and ground that couldn't be distinguished from each other. Kara, but drenched in a sticky black ichor, the fear in his eyes that had made my blood go cold when it looked at us, when it found its way through the mist. My stomach turns as I remember, the sensation of falling, catching myself on my... I must have slept wrong on my arm. The dull, stinging pain still shines through. That's what must have come in through in the dream. I wish it made the pain in my head go away, too. I wish it calmed my heart back to a normal pace. I hear the unmistakable sound of retching, and I realize the bathroom door is open. Kara, I wince at the pitiful whisper that is all I am able to conjure up. I'm being ridiculous. What exactly am I scared of? Of course it's Kara. Who else could it be? People don't break into houses to throw up in their bathrooms. It's just Kara. The reassurance doesn't seem to do me much good. My knees shake as I slide out of bed, and I can't help but go as slowly and quietly as I possibly can, even though I know I should be worried about him. He didn't really eat much on our little adventure, and I didn't see him fix anything for himself when we came home. I don't know what he could be throwing up. We had the same number of drinks last night, and I can barely handle alcohol. The first sun is just barely starting its rise, so while the sky isn't completely dark, there's no real light in the rooms. All it seems to do is animate the shadows. My heart's pounding in my ears, so loud and forceful that it's nauseating. I don't know if it's the vestiges of instability that came from that weird dream, but I'm jumping at everything, my mind conjuring shapes and entities out of the shadows, but when I blink, it's all gone again. There's a bout of coughing from the bathroom, quickly followed by a series of words I don't know, and before I can lose my nerve, I peek my head into the tiny room. It's all gone quiet, but the faint light is more than enough to recognize the figure crouching beside the toilet. Thank the stars. It is just Kara. Just as I knew it would be, even if my mind wouldn't listen. I don't know why he's throwing up. If he ate something that doesn't agree with him, or if he really did end up drinking too much, but for the moment I don't care. Kara's here, and that makes something inside me relax a small yet oh-so-significant amount. Nothing's wrong. At least, nothing we can't fix. I can't help but smile at the thought. It seems so childish and stupid, but it's true. We've gotten through a lot together, and with the semester coming to an end, it's like we can conquer anything. But for now, I'd settle for a few more minutes in bed with him. It's been a while since he got regular sleep in his own bed. Perhaps he's just feeling the after-effects of working himself too hard. He might be coming down with something, my mind supplies. Chef always said that if you work too hard, you'd eventually come down with a fever, if nothing else. It weakens your body, or something like that. Kara, are you okay? I ask, loud enough now that he should hear me, especially since there are only a few feet between us, but 
He makes no move at the sound of my voice. He just sits there, his fingers knotted in the plush little rug outside the shower. His breathing's gone ragged. I'm right next to him, and yet it's like I'm not even there. His eyes just stare blankly forward, hazy in a way I've never seen before. He has to be sick. It's the only explanation that makes sense. But when I raise my hand to try and test the temperature of his forehead, he flinches away from my touch. N no, I'm sorry. I d d didn't mean... His eyes go wide, and he cuts himself off with an odd, high-pitched sound that I've only really ever heard coming from me. C kara I try again, wincing as any words of comfort that might follow die in my throat. He's clearly not himself, but that's not what concerns me. I have seen this kind of behavior before. Hell, I know I get this way sometimes. I just never thought a master could malfunction. I wonder if it's just as bad for them as it is for us. Kara hadn't seemed to be the type to fall prey to his own mind, and I've never seen him like this before. I wonder if it really is the same, if he took too many blows to the head at some point, if someone hurt him, or rather, who. I know the rest of his half-finished sentences. I've said them more times than I can count. Hell, I've said them in my sleep. And I don't doubt I've said them in the gaps of memory that I have from my old masters. I've heard plenty of other pets say them, use them to beg. I know the words, they aren't exclusive. I've just never heard a master say them. k Kara. I hate the way my voice shakes. I want to comfort him, like he always manages to do for me. He doesn't look at me like I'm lesser than, just because I'm messed up inside, but I can't get myself to move forward. My hands are trembling, and even though I want to, I can't force them to uncurl from my chest. I'm scared. I don't know what will happen if he flinches away from me again. Blue. He asks more than he calls, his voice just a hair's breadth above a whisper. There's a certain amount of disbelief there as his eyes focus in on me, as though he's just now noticed me standing beside him. Kara? My voice dies in my throat. I'm not exactly sure what I wanted to say anyways, but somehow saying nothing hurts more. He shies away from me lowering his eyes, hiding behind the curtain of his long hair. It's wrong. It's all wrong. I want to comfort him. I want to say something that will make him feel better, or at least make him tell me what's wrong. I bite the inside of my cheek and practice the questions. Are you all right? Did something bad happen? Are you feeling sick? But all that comes out is... Can we go back to bed? For once, I want him to slap me. I'd do it myself if I didn't think it would make the situation worse. Stars, could I sound like any more of an ass? It's got to be bad if it's affecting Kara this strongly. He's usually so good at letting things go, not worrying about them or obsessing until there's a dozen new problems like I do. And what do I say to the first real time he's shown any true distress? Well, I see you're feeling like shit. You want to completely ignore that and get into bed? Y yeah Carr's voice startles me out of my own musings, but luckily he isn't waiting for a response. He picks himself up and uses the counter to stabilize himself. He tosses water on his face and uses some of that mint paste to wash out his mouth before he smiles at me in the reflection of the mirror. I make myself look away. I don't deserve that smile. He should be furious with me. I'm furious with myself. I want to comfort him. I want to touch him, put my hand on his shoulder, give him a hug. Some kind of simple affection, just like he's offered me. I want to do as much for him as he's done for me. But I can't even force myself to move forward. I just 
stand there, paralyzed by fear and indecision, unable to even move my hands from my sides. Does he want to be touched? There are times when it's the worst thing, when I want to be left alone and just sit in the dark until I've calmed. Is this one of those times? Or is it worse that it seems like I don't want to touch him? Like I'd ever be so bold as to refuse giving a simple, comforting touch. The behavior's not off-putting, it's just unexpected. His fingers circle my wrist, the gentle touch more than enough to shock me out of my thoughts. I jerk back out of Kara's gentle hold without thinking, the sharp motion bringing a renewed flash of pain down my arm. I can't bring myself to look up at him, to see the disappointment, anger, shame on his face. It's hard enough just to watch as he withdraws his hand. I... His voice cracks, and I can't stop the wince that comes automatically. I know what that feels like, the knotted pain that stops words in your throat, but he recovers faster than I ever did. Just to bed, then. We've got a few hours. I just hang my head and nod. It was my idea anyways. Does he think I don't want to anymore? Can I blame him? I'm being a less than standard comfort animal. I don't know what to say or what to do. I don't think I've ever been so terribly conscious about where my hands are, and it's making me a fidgety mess. Carl walks stiffly, and I can't help but wonder if there actually is something wrong, or if he's only slept weirdly like I did. He pulls himself back into bed. It's all more a controlled slide than any purposeful motion, and I can see the wear of something unbelievably heavy on his face. Qualls are over, and he'd seemed plenty relieved last night, so I'm not sure what it is that has him looking so tired and worn. I'm not a service pet. I'm not trained to recognize signs of emotional or physical distress, and I sure as hell don't know what the proper response is to this kind of activity. Kara takes a second to just breathe before he rolls himself onto his back. The effort takes more out of him than it should. But when he looks over at me, I can see the heart-wrenching hesitance he has on his face, as though he thinks that I really won't join him. I may not know exactly what to do, but I do know what's worked in the past. I know that I won't be able to be this bold if I do any more thinking, so I let myself feign a confidence I don't have as I climb onto the bed and straddle his hips. I can't give either one of us the option to run away. Whatever may come of this, we need to talk about it. And if this is the only way to force us both to stay in the same place, so be it. Kara's face immediately colors. Everything from his cheeks to the tops of his ears is dusted with a faint red blush, and I can't help the absurd impulse to giggle. It feels like he makes me blush all the time. I'm glad I am still capable of returning the favor. This whole ordeal is almost worth it for the look on his face alone. Blue, what are you doing? He asks. The concern in his voice doesn't match the sweet-looking smile he's wearing. I wonder how he does that. How he manages to achieve two entirely different states at the same time. He's done it before. A lot of the time we're in school, and especially in front of Genevieve. It's an impressive skill wearing a different emotion than what you're feeling. It's not something that I even have that strong a grasp on. The silence drifts and I can see the tension bleed back into him, though the smile remains. I don't like it. I don't like the look in his eyes, the way his body is tense under me, or the way he keeps smiling. I don't want to be one of the people he has to lie to. I wonder if the smile is as painful as it seems. My hand reaches out on its own, barely brushing the little dimple on his cheek when he flinches back. Kara looks away, putting his eyes anywhere that I am not. It doesn't make the feeling any better. It just worsens the pain in my chest. I pull my hand away and twine my fingers in the bedsheets. It was wrong of me to touch him, 
He's not feeling good, and he probably doesn't want to be touched. I'm just making everything worse. I'm sorry, I try to start, but Kara puts a hand behind my back and pulls me down until I'm resting on his chest. I squirm there for a moment. He can't really want me here. It can't be comfortable. I know I don't weigh much, but I'm literally resting on his chest. Kara just pets a hand down my back until I settle. I press right into the crook of his neck and take a deep breath, trying to calm myself. Kara's not mad that I'm touching him, and that odd tension has yet to return, so I feel safe assuming that this is good. It's relaxing for me, at least. So much so that I have to stop myself from kneading my hands over the soft linen, making biscuits in the sheets. I feel so comfortable I don't want this moment to end. I catch myself dozing off, so when I have to force my eyes open for the second time, I try to keep my mind occupied. I trace the lines of his face, the curve of his neck, the swirly pattern that his hair makes on the bedspread. It's been too long since we've had a nice, quiet moment. Kara gives a little snort. The puff of warm air ruffles my hair, and I lift my head up enough to find the dark gray dots of his eyes. Why do you always do that? He chuckles warmly, but I have no idea what he's talking about. What? I whisper, my voice oddly deep and scratchy from sleep. Whenever I hold you close, you're always squinting, or you close your eyes all the way, he explains as I quirk my ears to the side, and he pets just behind them. Well, I... I find myself stuttering. Does he really not know? I have to remind myself that he's never really had a pet before, that there's no way he would know these kinds of things. I let my hand leave its place on the sheets as I try to find his jaw. Predictably, I come into contact a lot later than I expected and give a slight wince as I try to run over the area a little more gently with my finger. I can't really see you up this close, I whisper, but I can feel the stiffening in Kara's body that tells me he's heard me. What? he asks, his fingers finding their way under my chin as he tilts my face up towards his. I squint a little harder trying to focus on his face, but I know it's of no use. I can barely make out his features at this distance. I... well, not a lot of cats can see well up close. I feel an unreasonable urge to defend myself. Really? I can tell Kara doesn't believe me, but I try not to feel too disheartened. Y yeah that's... well, you see how my pupils slitted? I ask, blinking and trying to purposefully unfocus my eyes. I know my pupils get rounder when I focus. The last thing I need is for him to call me a liar. Yeah? Kara mumbles, turning my head with just the lightest press of his fingers underneath my chin. I know I shouldn't preen, but it feels kinda nice to have the attention when I know exactly what he's looking for. At least I know I can't mess anything up. Cats don't see very well up close, but some of the different breeds have bred out that trait. I don't mention that it's most breeds that have any kind of pedigree. Avery's pupils are perfectly round. I bet she doesn't have any trouble up close. Honestly, I don't understand why the trait is still present. It's a lot more effective for common house cats, or so they've told me. The trait helps increase the field of vision and better determine depth when they pounce, but it's pretty much useless when height is added to the mix. The benefits diminish the taller you get, so on me it's more of a burden than an advantage. But people only really take the effort to fix traits in the breeds they want to see, I guess, so I shouldn't be too surprised. Does it bother you? Kara's question startles me out of my musings. What? I can't help but ask automatically. I'm not sure what he's asking me. I don't like not being able to see up close, but it's not like it's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. It doesn't often bother me, 
and it doesn't even come up that much, except when I fumble with things and my masters get mad at me. Not being able to... He starts to explain, but then he cuts himself off, his arms tightening around me where they are. Wait, how are you able to read? I... No, it, it doesn't get bad unless it's right in front of my face. I try to explain, doing my best to ignore the rising heat in my cheeks. I feel odd being the one to explain this to him. That and the genuine concern it seems to be soliciting. So long as it's eight or so inches away from my face, it's fine. I can't help but smile as I snuggle back into Kara's neck. The suns have started their rise in earnest, the bright rays filling the room with warmth. I don't want to move, but... I know it's inevitable, and I'd rather it be on my schedule rather than have to run after the hours we've lost. I suppose we should get going, I mumble into Kara's sleep shirt. I know we have to leave, but I can't exactly bring myself to say it any louder. Ugh, I don't want to move. He huffs, wrapping his arms around me again, holding me so close that I don't want to do anything to ruin this. How about we just stay here all day? He offers, like he's serious, and I can't help but giggle along with the joke. Kara, if we stay in, we're going to be late. How about we just skip? He mumbles into my hair. People skip the day after qualls, sometimes, I've heard. I pull away from him, steadying myself on my arms, studying his face as closely as I can. He's not kidding. He's seriously considering not going in today. Don't you have a test today? I ask, like I don't already know. It's one of the three he still has left. The other two are at the start of next week. It's not until the afternoon. He defends weakly, his fingers looping into my nightshirt as he feebly tries to tug me back down. I can pop in for that. We didn't skip when you almost died from that forest monster, I remind him, but I doubt he's forgotten the episode. That's different, he says stubbornly. I didn't almost die. And this was so much worse? I ask incredulously. So much worse, he huffs as he nuzzles into my hair once again. I can't tell if he's being serious. I hadn't imagined that Qualls had taken such a harsh toll on him. He'd seemed quiet and a little dazed when we'd been coming home, but he didn't seem that disturbed by the test. What's wrong? You've never wanted to skip. I trail off, hoping that it'll prompt him into talking about what really happened. Maybe I'm turning into a rebel, he mutters instead. I can't help the way I curl in on myself. It's not that I don't trust him. Stars, no. We've been through more than enough together that he deserves a little faith, but the words unnerve me. The uncomfortable silence we descend into is cloying, and even if I wanted to speak, I doubt that I could get the words out now. I'm sorry, Kara says eventually, but I doubt he's looking at me. He's thrown his hand over his face, pinching the bridge of his nose in a familiar gesture. W what are you sorry for? I can't help the shakiness as I ask. I don't want him to feel bad, but really he has nothing to be sorry for. I'm sorry about last night, he says slowly, as though those few simple words convey the depth of his thoughts. You already regretting taking me out? I try to smile and poke fun, but there's no mirth in my voice. It's stupid anyways. What we did last night was very dangerous, and probably very illegal. But still, it had been nice. We'd been together for the entire night, and we even danced together. The whole area was so pretty decorated, but in hundreds of different styles, as though the streets had been claimed by an artist's guild, but each professional had been given free reign to do with the space what they wished. 
It may not have been the type of thing I would have chosen, but it was something I didn't even know existed. It was special and beautiful, and now Kara regrets ever having shown me the place. No, I don't... Kara starts, halting his words until he's carting his fingers through my hair. I regret not listening to you, but I don't regret taking you out. I had fun, I admit haltingly, trying to regain the levity that our conversation had previously held. You... Kara cuts himself off as he searches for the right words. Instead, he simply pats the top of my head once but his fingers don't return to my hair. You don't have to lie. It's okay. You were uncomfortable. I was just... being stupid. You weren't stupid. You wanted us to have a good time. I try to reassure him, but he just cuts me off. Yeah, but I shouldn't have pressured you. I made you walk around and you were really uncomfortable and... oh. St Stars, did you even like those weird foods? His words come out in a rush so quickly that I have to force myself to just focus on the last question he'd ask. I... I start, about to reassure him, but I feel myself trail off. He doesn't know anything about cats, so is it possible that he just doesn't know? By the time I resign myself to throw caution to the wind and just tell him... I've been quiet too long. Oh, stars, he whimpers, covering his face with his hands. Well, I mean, at least you liked the candied hickory nuts, all the other sugary stuff, right? He sounds so hopeful, I almost want to agree and just drop everything, but he deserves to know, right? Kara, most cats can't taste sweet. I admit, pressing my face as closely as I dare into the soft fabric of his nightshirt. It's no use. He still hears me. What? he asks, tone somewhere between mortified and offended, and I cringe even as I try to cling to his nightshirt, pressing myself as closely as I can to him. It's another human alteration in d um, pets. As far as I know, only a few cat breeds that I've met can actually taste sweet things. And even then, it's because of some selective genetic modification. I explain haltingly, almost tripping up and spilling all the pitiful little that I know about Demi's. It weighs heavily on me that I still haven't mentioned my discovery to him, but he's occupied enough as it is without an impromptu confession. One shock a day is more than enough, and for now I'll settle on the brief lesson on cat types rather than tell him I've been running around without supervision. I don't know much, but I know my ability to taste sugar is pretty rare. It's something the others were jealous of, even though the sensations were still muted in comparison. I doubt Vanna could taste sweets. So you can't even taste? Kara starts, but I cut him off, seeing the confusion early. I got the weird trait that lets me taste it. Don't get me wrong, it's great and all. I just... it takes a lot for me to even taste it. I confess, though I suppose something in the lackluster way that I say it must clue him in. Do you even like my pastries? he asks and I'm so thrown by the genuine hurt in his voice that I immediately backtrack. Of course I do! They're delicious! Even if I can't really taste sweet all that well, they are really good! I try my best to retract my words and tell him how much I truly appreciate his pastries, but somewhere in the middle he cuts my ramblings short. So that's why you like jam cookies? The sugar in the preserve is enough for you to taste the sweetness, he asks hesitantly, as though he's unsure he's interpreting my words correctly. Foods with sugar concentrations that are high enough for me to taste them were pretty rare as treats. I nod against his chest. I like them as a novelty. I didn't get to try many things that I could actually taste the sugar in. I feel my face heat. 
I mean, it's really all or nothing at this point. V for a really long time, the only thing I got to taste that was sweet was honey dust. I admit, trying really hard to simply ignore the way Kara stiffens beneath me. I cling to him like I have no shame, but to be honest, I really don't have any. I don't care what he thinks of the way I stubbornly twine my fingers in his nightclothes like I have any right to. Not right now. Not when the difference means that he'd push me away now that he knows just another one of my pitiful little secrets. So that's why you like salty foods better. The way he says it makes it less of a question, more of a statement. Y yeah I admit cautiously. We did the experiment a while ago. He knows I like salty foods, but I suppose I was never really truthful about why. I had just assumed he knew. I had no reason to think otherwise. And who was I to stop him when he was trying out all the different kinds of food he was capable of making, trying to find something that would be my favorite? I can taste the nuances better in salty food. Even though I'm trying to be objective, it still makes my stomach turn to be admitting this so late, especially because I know it's caused my master some distress. Stars, I am the worst person ever! I didn't even know you couldn't- Hey! Why didn't you say something? Almost all the things I got you last night were sweet! Kara wails, thumping his forehead with his hand, and- I can't help but smile into the soft fabric of his nightshirt. Almost all the carts were selling sweet things, I remind him, but he seems to take my words the wrong way. You could have told me you weren't having any fun. We could have done something else. I could have found— He's starting to ramble. The same nervous tension that I've come to recognize is slowly creeping back into his body, so I just cut him off. I did have fun. I liked the— I wave my hands around, trying to find the right words to stop him from feeling bad. Area! It was really pretty, and all of the weird foods and the music was nice. I was just worried. I finish rather lamely. My voice goes quiet as I close my eyes and force one hand away from the soft material of Kara's shirt so that I can draw patterns on the linen beneath us. I don't know why the admission makes me feel so small. But out of all the fears that I'd had, of all the nightmarish scenarios my imagination had cooked up, nothing really bad happened last night. We weren't discovered, no one saw through my disguise, and we didn't even have to lie. Did you like it? He asks, and I'm so caught up in my own thoughts that I'm racking my brain to remember what we were talking about. What? I ask, feeling more lost than ever. Just thinking about it makes my head spin and my stomach hurt. I just want the anxiety to go away. Nothing bad happened. So why do I have to continue to fixate on it? There was no one there that would recognize us from our real lives. I should be happy. You dress in my clothes often enough, so I figure it's not a problem with my clothes entirely. I can hear the warm smile in Kara's voice as he tugs half-heartedly at the nightshirt that I'm wearing. His nightshirt. I figured you wouldn't mind it for a night on the town. He says it with warmth, so I can't imagine it's a veiled reproach. I wear some of his things from time to time, stealing his oversized articles for myself. For some reason, they keep me warm better than my own clothes. And if they happen to smell like him, well then, that's a fortuitous side effect. Still, it doesn't explain why it's being brought up now. I... I don't under... I try to articulate my confusion, but he cuts me off. Your features, they're easier to disguise than a lot of other familiars, he explains. And I suppose, in hindsight... I can see how he might have thought he was being clear. It was s strange, I admit, 
since there's no point in lying. I've never done that before, never dreamed of doing it or getting away with it. I worry that we could have gotten in trouble. Blue, I'm sorry. I didn't... He cuts himself off with a curse. I wasn't thinking. I didn't mean to put you in danger. He holds me close and presses his lips to the top of my head. The moment has become so serious that I feel obligated to let my ears twitch until they're batting softly at his cheeks. The laugh that bubbles up warms me from the inside out. I can't remember ever being so perfectly content. As far as apologies go, it is one of the more heartfelt ones. I haven't received many, but I honestly believe he's being sincere, and that's more than I can say for the ones I'm used to. I like the way he holds me, how warm he is, how special the closeness makes me feel, even though he doesn't have much of a choice, as I'm the one draped over him. Still, that's not entirely true. I'm draped over him, but he could always push me aside. Even if he didn't, he could always just lay there passively. There was a time that I would have seen such an allowance as the kindest, most lenient thing in the world. But he's not just letting me cuddle next to him. He's not just allowing my presence. He's holding me. He holds me close, like I'm something precious. Like I'm something that needs to be... loved. Maybe I'm just reading too much into this, drunk on all the contact after more than a week of abstinence, but even just the thought is nice. I was confident that we wouldn't get caught, and, well, it seemed like a worthwhile risk at the time. He mumbles into my hair. I feel my cheeks heat at that. I could listen to his voice forever, but... I don't like the way his tone dips. I want this moment to be happy, even if it's just for a little while. I just thought it would be nice if you could walk around without getting glares. His voice is getting sad again. I don't like it. I don't want him to sound sad. I don't like getting glares for existing either, but... It's never been a matter of trying to find a way to get people to be nice. Hell, half the time I can barely manage to get my master to care about me. I don't often have the time to worry about what other people might think. I let my fingers run over the soft material before allowing my hands to curl in Kara's shirt. I want him to stop. I don't really want to talk about this. As nice and refreshing as his concern is. I don't want to think about the bad things. I know it's stupid. I know he's apologizing, but still, it's making me think about it, and that's bad enough. Please stop. Just let me forget. Just hold me and keep me warm, all right? Please? I'm purring before I can articulate anything meaningful, but I hope it gets my point across. He likes my purring, and I feel safe asking for help from him. He pets a hand down my back, and I let myself purr for him. It's odd feeling another body against mine as my whole chest rumbles. I don't think I've ever done this before. I remember purring. Some people liked it, others didn't, but I've never been held against someone when I do it. It makes me so much more aware of the body under me of the incredible warmth, of the fact that there's just two thin pieces of fabric that separate us. Well, I guess you got a little more than just ignored. Kara chuckles as he tousles my hair, tickling the base of my neck, but my blood goes cold as I jerk away from his hands. I'm sorry. The words are out of my mouth before I can cringe at their inadequacy. I need something a hell of a lot better than that for the trouble I'm in. I can't believe I'd let myself forget about the man at the bar. The man who tried to give me a drink and dance with me. The one who I'd managed to entice even though I'd been with my master at the time. I couldn't 
believe it at the moment. I wasn't a pet any more. I wasn't some thing on display, something to gawk at and ogle. I was disguised as a person, a human, and yet even still. My face burns at the memory. I know the words, the way my masters have described me in the past. Such a pretty little thing. Tempting me, are you? Look at this little slut. Can't leave him empty for too long. It'd be a crime. The people in a position to take what they wanted rarely restrained themselves after I'd been passed down, after I was used enough that they didn't have to worry about serious repercussions. Each time they'd say something like that, I knew what they meant. It all blended together after a while. I was a whore, and it was what I was good for. Sometimes they'd wait for my current master to give permission. Sometimes they said they couldn't help themselves. It was always worse when I was tempting, too tempting for them to resist, though I was never quite sure what I did to be so alluring. But each time, my master would rain down a punishment. I almost preferred it. When someone took what was my master's, it came with a penalty, even if I had to serve some kind of punishment as well for being tempting. It was so much worse when nothing came of the acts. Well. He's such a good little whore. How could I have expected any different? You'll just bend over for anyone that walks your way, won't you? I can't even say I'm disappointed. Should I invite him back here? Maybe I'll ask if he'll fuck my used little whore and you'll actually be entertaining for once. You don't have anything to be sorry about, Kara says, his brow furrowing as though he doesn't understand what I'm apologizing for. He's been terribly lenient with me, but I need him to know. He didn't want a whore, and I've tried so hard not to be something he hates. He's taken time with me. He's trained me out of the old habits. For fuck's sake, he's told me that I'm not allowed to have sex with just anyone who asks. I have to tell them that it's something my master forbids and go find him. I let myself remember the rule, one of the first and few he's given me. I don't mean to be alluring. I hate the words so much I can feel the beginnings of tears prickling at the corners of my eyes. It wasn't your fault. The guy had too much to drink and he got a little handsy. He says it like it's obvious, like it had nothing to do with me. But it was my fault. I try to explain to him again, but Kara just cuts me off. You are beautiful, but that doesn't give anyone the right to make a move. He says the words so simply, as though they're simple, indisputable facts. Right, that was what he said at Genevieve's party, too. Just because Catherine had wanted to have me, just because she felt that I needed to take responsibility for her arousal, didn't mean that my master agreed with her. He'd said it wasn't my fault then, too. You protected me. I try instead. I hate the way my tail nearly wags at the memory, but with all of this apologizing, I want to thank him. Yeah. He frowns, letting his eyes fall closed and his head fall back onto the pillow behind him with a soft thud. I think I had too many drinks as well. Oh. My ears lay flesh against my skull, and I immediately feel foolish. Of course he would feel that his defense of me was merely the byproduct of too much liquor. I don't know why I thought any differently. Surely, if he'd been perfectly sober, he wouldn't have attacked someone else on my behalf. He would have seen that the blame was... Oh, no, Blue! I just mean I shouldn't have scared him off with magic," Kara says in a rush, bracketing my cheeks in his hands as he forces me to look at him. If I'd been sober, I would have punched him in the face. He admits, in a tone that's so casual I can't help but believe him. His hands don't leave my face, but he does let go of the guiding grip. Instead, he simply brushes my hair out of my face, tracing tender lines over my cheeks 
down my neck until I'm a blushing mess. Blue. He speaks again, his whole demeanor more subdued. I know I'm an idiot sometimes, and sometimes can be a lot of the time, but how have you been doing? What? I ask. The question catches me so off guard that I'm not even sure what he means for me to say. It's been a crazy week, and I haven't been around like I should have, so I wanted to check in, he reiterates looking me over much more closely this time. I can't help but squirm under the close eye he passes over me. Is there something wrong? I... I... I try to speak, but all the words die in my mouth. He wants to check in? What the hell does that mean? You can tell me anything. If anything's bothering you, if you feel bad, if there's something wrong that you want me to try and fix, even if you think there's nothing I can do, I still want to know. I just may surprise you. He smiles, brushing the curly bit of my bangs out of the way, only to have it fall back into place. For some reason, the gesture must bring him some measure of happiness. I'm just glad I can see him smile like that. The feeling doesn't last long as I lay back down so that he might play with my hair a little more closely. I make the mistake of resting my right cheek on his chest, as looking left only makes me face the bookshelves, full of the many books and notebooks Carr has accumulated in his time, and the one I replaced, at the end of the line of empty notebooks. It seemed as good a place as any to hide the book at the time. A notebook alone might look out of place anywhere else, but among a good dozen of its kind, no one would notice a thing. There's nothing wrong, I force myself to say. There really isn't. All the troublesome activity has passed. Now all that's left is to make it so that no one ever has to know I did anything bad. I just... I've missed this. You don't have to worry about me. Kara considers this for a long second, so long that I find myself holding my breath. He wouldn't have let this charade go on so long if he knew, right? He would have given me a chance to fess up, but then he would have read out my infractions, would have let me know that he knew I lied to him. I would understand if he pet me, tried to lull me into a false sense of security, but all this? It seems like a tad much just to extract a confession. You're very brave. He says it without an ounce of hesitation without any derision in his tone, without anything that sounds even the slightest bit threatening, and I can do nothing more but wonder why. Not, I mumble as I try to snuggle further into his arms. I'm serious. Car starts up again like I haven't just dismissed his words. You're very brave, and smart, and beautiful and the best heated compression blanket I could ever ask for. He adds on with a grin, and I can't help but blush and squirm under so much direct attention. Still, regardless of how inaccurate he is, it makes me want to deserve all the titles he's given me. H how are you doing? I find myself asking, before I've truly thought it through. Kara seems to be of the same mind, as his only answer is a somewhat confused, What? It's been hard for me. It's been agony, thinking I did wrong, but knowing that it's only the nature of his coursework that had him separated from me so thoroughly that there might as well have been a brick wall in place, makes it seem a little easier. I'm reassured. There's really nothing we could have done differently. And now that it's all over, it's going to be fine. But still, it couldn't have been a cakewalk for him, either. But have you been okay? I eventually find the right words to ask. Kara's startled silent for a moment, and if it weren't for the continued pressure of his arms around me, I would have launched into a fearful litany of apologies long ago. 
I've missed this, he answers finally, giving me a little squeeze as he does so, as though I could have possibly been confused as to what this was. Still, I want to hear him say it, so I feign ignorance. This? I ask, quirking my ears in the way I know he finds so adorable. Cuddling, hanging out with you, talking, Kara answers, much less reticent than I'd originally thought. I'm just glad that nightmare is over. He huffs out a breath, and I can't help but wonder if one little test was really so bad. How was Qualls? I ask, trying and failing to sound casual. Kara just rolls his eyes. I'm going to be kicked out of school when I fail, he groans. I can't parse the joke from his impersonation of a dying man, but I have to assume it's there. Please, with all the studying you did, you're sure to take highest honors. High honors, at least. I don't know much about the test, but I know the two metrics that mean you've done well, and with how much studying Kara's done, he's sure to do better than a simple passing grade. Well, I love your faith in me. I wish I could have your confidence. He sighs, getting a sudden faraway look on his face. It doesn't really matter how much you've studied, not on the day anyways. Some people study their whole lives and freeze up. Some people get lucky. You never know. He trails off, but I'm far more distracted by the bright rays of sun coming in from the window. Slowly, regretfully, I dismount Kara's prone form, removing myself from my heat source. As much as he may have joked in the beginning, I know he would end up regretting it if he didn't go to class today. He's not the kind of student that just ditches class on a whim, even when it's one of the last classes of the semester. I think Kara gets the idea of what I'm trying to do when he sees me picking out clothes from his drawer. At least... I assume he knows, because there's a groan that I'm truly impressed didn't come from an eight-year-old as I pass him his clothes for the day. There's nothing I can say to convince you to stay in bed with me, he whines, pulling his lip in between his teeth as he opens the blanket just a little, trying to entice me in. I can't help the way I snort. It's just such a funny image. You know, I'm supposed to be the wild tempter. I remind him, getting close, only to throw the covers off of him. So, we have an excuse. Kara smirks, that mischievous light in his eyes again, and I only have a moment to register the guiding hand under my chin before I'm pulled into a kiss. It's chaste, no tongue or fluids, no straying hands or lips, but somehow it's unbearably intimate. When he pulls away and takes his pile of clothes, I can still feel his warmth, can still feel the phantom pressure of his lips against mine. My fingers go to my lips, trying to mimic the pressure before I even know what I'm doing. I want another. I want more. But as I go to say something, Kara's already gone into the bathroom to change. Any reason why you're so excited about school today? He calls through the door. And I almost flinch at the sound of his voice. I'm still so caught up in the odd dream world I've been shuttled off to. I, I'm teaching today! I call back, pulling on my clothes as quickly as I can. Ugh, you're so responsible! I love it! He laughs, and the warm sound rings out into my chest, too. It's odd, getting ready for school has become such a rote set of motions, it all passes in a daze. And before I know it, we're at school, and Shauna's waving us down. The school's always been divided in the past. There are well-defined cliques as well as social groupings that closely imitate the standing of their families, but I don't think I've ever seen it as present as it is today. There's usually a buzz of activity around the school, but now... It looks almost like the necromancers got their wish. It's nothing but reanimated corpses all huddled together obeying the basest of their instincts. It's almost disturbingly quiet, but there is activity. 
it's just quiet. You have to pass by really close to hear anyone talking. But we don't even need to do that to understand exactly what they're all talking about. How do you think you did? Shauna asks as quietly as she can. Well, I couldn't say either way. Kara responds with no inflection. Hell, he doesn't even look up at her to answer. You know, I asked about that. One upperclassman is sure there's some kind of oculumency shit tied into the paper. At least it makes sense why you can't take it more than three times. Shauna does her best impression of a whisper, but it's still plenty loud enough for some students to turn their heads as we walk by. Occlumency. I've never heard of that. What makes you say that? Kara quirks a brow as Shauna lowers herself and cups a hand over her mouth like she's telling some great secret, not a theory she and some upperclassmen have. Occlumency gets a little screwy if you get affected too many times. The shielding messes with you, and if you aren't the one doing it, it can cause some weird things. Sometimes old memories get unsealed, and without training in the field yourself, you can run into some bad problems down the line, she whispers. That seems dangerous, Kara responds dryly, but I can tell that she has his attention, even though he doesn't want to seem too interested in the theory in front of prying eyes. I think it's why the Occlumens track is only for post-grads, after you don't have to take the test anymore. Shauna continues with her conspiracy theory, and I just look away. There's plenty of people watching us, so I play the Spot the Familiar game and try to see if there's anyone I recognize from my class. It doesn't take me too long before my eyes settle on Genevieve, standing in the corner of the green while the upperclassmen she usually hangs out with shake their heads. As soon as they see us, they smile and point us out, and before I can warn anyone, Genevieve's coming over to talk to us. I don't know what I'm expecting some thinly veiled jibe or some kind of witty remark about how Kara's probably failed what seems to be the biggest test of their lives. But she simply falls into step beside Kara. I don't have permission to stare the way I want, or even ask what she's doing. But then again, Shauna and Kara do, but they can't seem to find their words either. My parents wanted to invite you over for dinner. Genevieve speaks eventually, but when she does, she's not looking at Kara, even though it's plain to see that's who she was addressing. Honestly, I'm surprised it took so long for this to happen. With the disparity in their class rankings, I'm not surprised that the invitation wasn't immediate. Her parents probably thought this was some idle fascination that would be dropped once she'd grown bored, but with how long the little charade has dragged on. The parents needed to vet this little fascination of their daughters. No doubt her parents had heard some of the things that happened around the school. It's not likely they'd consider Kara an actual suitor, but at the very least they should be aware that he's enough of a figure that they shouldn't try and assassinate him. Whatever they've been saying has been entirely tuned out by my own musings. I only try to listen again when Genevieve turns her eyes to me and glares. No pets at this party! All right, she says to Kara, but I can feel her eyes on me. It feels like I'm some kind of specimen pinned down between two pieces of glass. E yeah, Blue is capable of staying at home for the night. Kara stumbles, seemingly confused, and I don't have the presence of mind to determine if that's from his ignorant act or being genuinely thrown off. Don't you need something better? I mean, the semester's nearly over. No one would judge you if you just... Whatever she was going to say is lost as Kara cuts her off. I'll take it under advisement, Jen. He says it with a smile, but even I can hear the venom behind those words. And I'll get back to you on the dinner thing. Well, just don't wait too long, she mumbles apparently satisfied with the interaction, or perhaps just considering her obligation fulfilled. We keep walking, but I can't help the urge to look behind us. Sure enough, the group is still looking over at us. 
My skin crawls, and I hurry to walk just a little bit closer to Kara. I don't like the look in their eyes, the way they show far too many teeth when they smile. There's something wrong with them, something that screams how dangerous they are, how much they resemble predators. Suddenly, Kewin's warning about the hunters flashes at the back of my mind. Is this what he really meant? The whole school's full of dangerous people, but are these three specifically worthy of such concern? Kalu's smirk turns into a wide smile that's just a hair's breadth from being pleasant. My heart seizes when I realize that he's looking at me. He's caught me staring. He raises his hand and gives a short wave before turning away. But I can't help but feel that I'm the one who lost. There's something fishy going on. And though I don't know what, I do know that those three are in the middle of it. I'm sure of it. My mind flashes to their movements in the library, their predatory grins. I might not know what they're up to just yet, but I know those are the ones Kewen was warning about. I need to protect Kara. I need to find out what the danger is before it's too late. Kewen said I'd have a better view of what happens than Kara. I can't help but wonder if that's because people don't really care what they say in front of pets, in front of familiars. I don't usually focus too hard on the idle gossip, but I find myself racking my brain to try and find some causal thread that links all of us. For now, I'll just have to be satisfied having found the hunters. I can worry about everything else later, but at least now it's not a directionless, formless enemy. I know what to look out for. And hell, maybe one of the familiars in my class knows something. There are always resources to tap. Kara doesn't even bother checking me in, just sees me to the center and waves me inside. I go straight to the little book and sign myself out for the day. The lesson doesn't start for an hour, but it'll be nice to stretch and get warmed up. The halls are nearly empty, and I can't help but smile. No one in the halls means no reason to hug the wall. Blue! I spin around at the sound of Kara's voice. I'm surprised he's still here. I'd thought he'd just dropped me off at the care center. And yet, here he is, smiling that soul-crushingly genuine smile that makes me feel so warm inside. His class is in the spire today, the opposite direction. Ka- Um, Master, isn't your class in the other direction? I feel my cheeks heat at the near slip. Yeah, but I don't get much of a break today with my test, and I figured I should give you a proper goodbye, he explains. And before I can ask what he means by that, he takes a quick glance down either end of the hallway before he presses a chaste kiss to my lips. Master, I croak, knowing that my face has gone a blotchy red color that cannot be attractive. But Kara just brushes his fingers over my heated cheek with a smile that reaches his eyes. It's all so unbearably intimate that I can't help but squirm. Still, I never move my head away from those gentle touches, even though there's nothing holding me there. I almost whine when he takes his hand away, pathetically grateful and yet needy for more. You're going to do great today, Blue. He smiles. The casual reassurance leaves me feeling warm, but as he turns to leave, I find myself latching onto his wrist. Master, I start before I really know what I'm going to say. I realize that I've never told him about Kewen's prophecy. I wonder if he'd believe me, or if he'd say it was stupid that I took an imp's words seriously. The fear is too great that he would simply dismiss the concerns. But if I don't tell him... What is it, Blue? Kara asks, his head quirked to the side as he glances down to where we're linked. I... Be careful with Genevieve and her friends. The warning comes out haltingly. I don't know exactly what I should be saying, or what warning he'll take seriously. I do know that I'm overstepping. But this was Kewen's warning. I don't know anything about what they're planning, 
how I'm supposed to get a better look at it than Kara will, but for now, there's no harm in having him be cautious. I don't know what I'd do if he got hurt and I could have prevented it. I'll be careful, I swear. He nods, still looking oddly at me, but the look passes in a moment as he takes my hand where I'm holding at his wrist. I'll make whatever you want for dinner tonight, so give it some thought. He gives my hand a squeeze, and I feel that it's a bit unfair that he gives a similar one to my heart as I watch him run off to his class. My heart shouldn't be beating like this. I've had his undivided attention all morning. I shouldn't be so greedy. It's so silly. But still, even as I step out into the courtyard, into the sunlight, I can't help but find myself missing his warmth. I'm so caught up in the odd, unfamiliar feeling, I almost knock into someone coming down the same path. I've gotten into the habit of walking with my head down. Most of us do. It helps cut down on accidental eye contact, and ever so occasionally provides an excuse for having bumped into something. I'm just glad I saw the man's shoes and stopped in time. Whoever it is stops in their path as well, perhaps taken off guard that a familiar nearly knocked into him, or maybe that a familiar would be out during the day unattended. I force back the whine that starts in the back of my throat. I have no reason to be afraid. I'm out with permission, and this time I'm even using it as intended. I move away, stepping to the side to let him go by, but he steps right back in front of me, blocking my path once again. I don't know who this is, but at least I know now that this wasn't a random occurrence. They want to stop me. I fold my hands demurely in front of me, hoping that pressing them together will hide the shaking as I cautiously look up. Ah! I knew it was you! The older, somewhat portly man in front of me smiles happily like he's just run into an old friend. I'm surprised he recognized me, and it takes me a lot longer to place where I've seen him before. Ollie, what the hell are you doing? Another voice grumbles from a few feet away, as a much younger, taller figure hastens to catch up with his companion. There's two of them. I hadn't even noticed the other one. He was standing much further away, and by his general disinterest I don't doubt that this is something that he wanted to do. I'm inclined to believe that this is less of a scheduled stop and more of his partner getting sidetracked. No, no, this is the one I was telling you about the other day, remember? Ali sounds giddy, like a little kid, though I can't imagine why he would be, over me of all things. Oh, stars, were you talking? The drone just kind of melted into the background. The barb doesn't land with any of the intended venom, as Ollie, the one standing in front of me, seems no less smiley for the other man's bristling. Um, I'm sorry, sirs. May I help you? I try to ask as sweetly as possible. It wouldn't do to get them mad at me, even though I don't really know why they stopped me. Yes! Do you remember me? Ollie asks pointing a finger at himself like I might get confused. Yes, sir. I saw you a few days ago. I say it as loud as I can force myself. I saw him a few days ago in the care center. I thought he looked odd, not dressed in mage's robes, but far too old to be a student. He was picking up some records or something, and had gotten quite turned around. They aren't here with the school, but if they came all the way back... I'm worried that someone might be in trouble. I'm terribly sorry if I caused you any trouble. I start to apologize halfway to a low bow when he stops me. No trouble at all. I told everyone in the office about you. Well. His cheeks flush red as he seems to realize what he's said, but his partner latches on to it. No, you're right. Everybody in the office, including a few interns that felt too weird about just telling you to shut the fuck up. He drags his hand over his face in the single most exasperated motion I've ever seen, but Ollie just purses his lips. Well, familiars parroting what their masters want to hear isn't new, but your candor was, he says, 
turning to me with a renewed brightness in his eyes. And when I asked around, apparently you two were at the center of the new casting debacle, and I just had to see if I could find you again. Imagine my surprise at finding you the second we got back on campus. He does seem rather happy, but his smiling, bubbly nature is undercut entirely by the menacing figure behind him. Very fortuitous, sir. I try to keep the pleasant, docile smile on my face. Is there anything you needed from me? I ask hesitantly, and then, because I have to, or your friend? We are not friends! I duck my head as the other nearly screams as he jumps to defend himself, like it's the worst possible label to be assigned. We are colleagues, Ollie responds, much more calmly. I apologize. I say it because I have to. I've made a mistake because I assumed something. But, privately, I can't help but think that the tall one would be lucky to have Ollie as a friend. Don't bother! Ollie waves me off. Rainy here's just a sourpuss. The corner of Rainy's mouth quirks up at that, and it takes Ollie a second to realize what he's just said, cheeks coloring as he tries to get back on track. He thought it was funny that you would preach so earnestly about your master's power. Rainy chuckles derisively like the whole situation had been made up to tell a story at the office. My master is very smart, I growl. The words are out of my mouth before I even think about it. I don't like this Rainy, but I suppose it's not my place to like him. Smart has a lot of different metrics, boy. We have a lot of different programs. I'd hate to see him thrown into one he's ill-suited for. Rainy sneers, using all his height to tower over me. I know I should, but I don't feel scared of him. I'm sure he would excel given any opportunity afforded to him, I answer, this time trying to maintain an air of docility. It wouldn't do for them to complain. I might get my free roam license revoked. You mean to say that your master would do equally well in any field he found work in? He chuckles derisively. I can tell he doesn't believe me, and I can't help the way my ears twitch in agitation. I... He has yet to discuss a preference for any particular schools of magic, and yet he excels in any field he tries. The words leave me in a rush, but immediately I regret them. Kara's doing well, but that doesn't mean he likes all his subjects equally. Not to mention, these official people probably don't need the words of a familiar. I'm just some kind of novelty, some cat that praises his master without being commanded. But I'm sure you don't need my words of praise. You have a lot of confidence in your master! Ollie speaks with a smile, and I'm thankful that he doesn't think I need punishment for the way I was talking. But there is that layer of condescension that makes it sound like he's talking to a four-year-old. But you're right. We are on our way to pick up some student records. If his qual scores match what you're spouting, well, I'm sure he'll get into the programs we're offering anyways. Rainy rolls his eyes, and I know I should count my blessings and just walk away, but... I can't help the way he makes me bristle. My master will take highest honors, I growl through gritted teeth. Well, if that is so, you will definitely see us again, little one. He has the audacity to pat me on the head, and it takes every fiber of restraint in my being not to bite him. Only a handful take that title, Ollie says gravely. Only about fifty each year across the country. Usually about fifteen come from this school. I resist the urge to scratch at the inside of my wrist. I didn't know that. I don't really know about anything that I'm talking about. That's why Kara was so hesitant to accept my admiration. He wasn't being modest. He was being practical. I feel so stupid. I suppose I am just spouting useless flattery. Maybe they were right about me being little more than a novelty, parroting praises. 
I'm sure a commoner taking a rank like that would get a good deal of attention. Even better, because the Crown Prince de Siren will be back in the state by next week. Ollie smiles, bumping Rainy with his elbow in a friendly gesture, but he only receives a growl for his trouble. Wow, the Crown Prince, that sounds special. I try to sound dumb, hoping they'll just let me by if they find me annoying. He makes the rounds for public interest things, especially one like this. Rainy rolls his eyes, something I'm starting to realize is probably a favorite activity of his. That, and his condescending smile. Wouldn't that be exciting? The crown prince in these halls. He says it like he's offering a treat to a dog. I nod along with wide eyes, pretending that the information is the most interesting thing in this world. You have to keep that a secret, though, all right, little one? We aren't supposed to let anyone know. It's all a surprise. You wouldn't want to ruin the surprise, Ollie asks, his voice so full of concern that it actually takes me aback. I nod along all the same, promising to keep the secret that they think is so valuable. It means nothing to me. Besides, who would I tell anyways?